Good evening, USA, and good morning, India. Uh, I am Dr. Ratika Shah, and I would like to welcome you all to the GCAR Journal Club meeting. Uh, this is our first Journal Club meeting of 2024. Journal Club is an educational initiative by GCAR where we can discuss published research articles to stay updated with latest research and promote evidence-based Ayurveda. Uh, a little introduction about GCAR, uh, Global Council for Ayurveda Research. I'll just share the website. Now, can you see? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Global Council for Ayurveda Research is an international nonprofit organization based out of USA with a sister chapter in India by the name of Ayurveda Anusandhan Abhyan Foundation, uh, AAAF. Our mission is to encourage, educate, and facilitate basic clinical and interdisciplinary uh, research in Ayurveda. Our vision is to promote and establish Ayurveda as an evidence-based health science globally. You can learn more about us at www.ayurvedaresearchusa.org. Please do consider joining us as a member, which will bring you access to all our resources. And no nonprofit can operate and succeed without volunteers. So consider joining us as a volunteer and we can place you in a variety of projects based on your skills and interests. Once again, our website is www.ayurvedaresearchusa.org. Now I would like to welcome our speaker, uh, Dr. Rajesh Kanwal. Uh, she's classically trained Vedya and an Ayurveda expert. She earned her postgraduate degree in Ayurveda Dhanvantri. Uh, she has an MS in Prasuti Tantra Sri Rok from National Institute of Ayurveda, Jaipur, India in 2023. She's a gold medalist in BMS from Dr. Sarvapali Radhakrishna Rajasthan Ayurveda University, Jodhpur. She's a seasoned practitioner and holistic health advocate with a profound understanding of Ayurveda. She is also a certified Iyengar yoga teacher, level one, and a skilled yoga therapist. She seamlessly integrates her expertise in Ayurveda and Iyengar yoga to promote overall well-being, offering a unique and comprehensive approach to health. Today, she will be discussing a research paper on Ayurveda intervention in management of uterine fibroids. Uh, it is a case series by Kamini Diman. So uh, over to you, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, would you, I'll stop sharing my screen so that you can share your screen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ritika, for that uh, kind introduction. And excuse me if I sound a little raspy, actually, I have a little bit sore throat, but I try my best to be clear. So let me share my screen. Okay, is my screen visible? Oh, yes, it's visible. Okay. okay. So as we all know, GCAR, Global Council for Ayurveda Research, is pioneering initiative to promote and establish Ayurveda as an evidence-based health science globally. And in this part, uh, every month, uh, we have general club meeting. So in today's uh, meeting, I'm presenting where uh, we discuss research paper, critically analyze them. So before we start, I want to declare that this presentation is for academic purpose to understand methods for critically appraising a scientific manuscript. It by no means intends to harm or criticize the investigator or author or any other personnel connected to the manuscript or clinical study. The views expressed here with are with sole purpose to be academic. So we declare no conflict of interest. So without delay, we can start. 
So as Dr. Ritika mentioned, today's study title is Ayurvedic Intervention in the Management of Uterine Fibroid, a case series. And uh, it is done by Dr. Kamini Dhiman. Source of the paper is IU, AYU, an International Quarterly Journal of Research in Ayurveda, published in July, September 2014. So I found this topic very interesting because uterine fibroid is uh, uh, in women life, it's a health issue. And many times, in my opinion, uh, they didn't get enough chance to try any other complementary or alternative uh, therapies or, uh, you know, treatment. And only treatment normally they advise is the surgery. Even there's the hysterectomy or myomectomy, but it's still it's painful. So I, I feel like it's a good thing we discuss it and a lot of people aware about that. There, there, are, there are any other uh, alternate alternates to treat this uh, disease. So in today's, we discuss overview of the study. Then we go through the points to critical uh, appraisal of this study. And uh, uh, we, uh, we discuss more about it through the points, introduction, materials and methods, study design, results, discussion, conclusion. So overview about this study. In this study, there are seven cases of uterine fibroid were taken and Ayurvedic intervention with the Ayurvedic formulation, Kachnar Gugulu, Shigru Gugulu and Haridrakhan. They were taken and they found very effective in uh, to shrink the uterine fibroid. The primary diagnostic tool uh, used uh, is uh, abdominal ultrasonography and also to assess after uh, management or treatment seven weeks, they use the same tool, uh, USG. And this suggests promising outcome in managing uterine fibroids through Ayurveda and showcasing the potential of these herbal formulation as a treatment modality. So um, when they design the study, I believe there are many reasons behind it. One thing, um, after uterine fibroid, because it's it happened in reproductive age, so sometimes there are uh, infertility issues also. If there are fibroid uh, implantation, uh, it's it, it doesn't occur. A recurrent pregnancy loss also happened. So many people accept surgery. They want something else and they want to, um, you know, preserve uh, uterus or the integrity of uh, women body. One reason is that sometimes many people, they can't afford the uh, surgery. So again, they want something else. And moreover, in this study, um, in fibroid, they take it as a granthi, which is encapsulated uh, growth. And uh, in Ayurveda, they take the samprapti and the samprapti vigatan. So uh, basically the Ayurveda principle, how we can break the pathogenesis of granthi or any kind of growth, uh, cyst, etc. And they completely work on the Ayurveda principles. A study site is Department of Prasuti Tantra and Stri Rog, Rajiv Gandhi Government Postgraduate Ayurveda College, Paprola, Kangra, Himachal Pradesh, India. Introduction, uterine fibroid, it's a non-cancerous -cancer, growth of the uterus that often appear during childbearing age of female and also known as fibromyomas, leomyomas or myomas. So it's not like uh, it never happened after, you know, uh, menopause or uh, like that. It happens, but due to it's a high estrogen uh, condition, so after menopause and during the period of perimenopause, because it's the decline of the estrogen, so automatically uterine fibroids started to shrink so mainly That's why we say it's a uh, reproductive age issue. In Ayurveda, if we see directly, there is no uh, description of uterine fibroid. But as uh, we see in the Ayurveda text, Granthi is very, in a descriptive ma ma manner, uh, they talk about it. There are ma nine types of the Granthis, which can be Granthi, Arbud, Apachi, 
Ganmala, they all comes under the Granthi. Uterine fibroid, we can consider it Garbhashya Gat Granthi, which means intrauterine uncapsulated growth. And uh, Granthi is originated from Mans and Meda, which is muscle and fat tissue and blood tissue, which can be the Dushas. And due to vitiation of Vata humor mixed with Kapha humor, they produce round, protuberant, naughty and hard swelling, which can be correlated to uterine fibroid. Uh, regarding clinical features, when we uh, take account um, Granthi as a fibroid, according to the anatomical and physiological disturbances, clinical features also change. That means where uterine fibroid is located, what is its size and how it affects. That's how uh, different symptoms uh, female present. Uterine fibroid, they do not have definite medical treatment in the conventional. They have hormonal therapies, again, according to the age, the size and location of uh, the uterus, and then surgery. And thus making the patient seek alternative therapies of healing. Another thing, when there is um, urgent need, surgery is a good option, but still, even though um, challenges remain to establish, can we have a conservative treatment for uterine fibroids? And this also makes this study um, interesting. In this study, they said several factors contribute to the decision to avoid surgery. Even though patients which were taken in this case series, they were advised hysterectomy, but they want to avoid surgery and there, there can be many reasons. They want to desire to preserve anatomical and functional integrity, fear of surgical procedure, patient age, financial constraint, social consideration. So here in Ayurveda, the approach involves managing the condition based on the principle of Samprapti Vigatan, which is um, breaking the pathogenesis of Granthi or encapsulated growth, aiming to disrupt the pathogenesis and address underlying causes without resorting to surgery. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then I found another uh, study that says validation of hysterectomy indications and the quality assurance process. So in this study, they says, because of the result of this study, adenomyosis, which is exactly not uh, uterine fibroid. It is different from uterine fibroid, but they have uh, similar symptoms. So many times adenomyosis misdiagnosed as uterine fibroid. Adenomyosis is nothing, but it is the growth of uh, inner lining of the uterus, which is endometriosis into the muscular wall of uterus. So in this study, adenomyosis, because of its low 38% verification rate, is no longer considered a reliable preoperative indication for hysterectomy. I put the link is here because I, I feel like if we can um, have more studies regarding uterine fibroids, can we set some indications or um, for the reliable preoperative indication for hysterectomy because every case of uterine fibroid uh, should not go for surgery or not advise the surgery. So can we um, set uh, reliable preoperative indications in case of uterine fibroid? In the view of these facts and keeping in mind uh, treatment limitations of this problem, a hypothesis regarding conservatory treatment protocol was made in this study. What is happening? My slide is not going further. Okay. Then methodology. So patients showing signs of uterine fibroids underwent clinical examination. Before we go further, Uterine fibroids, normally we say them they are uh, presented in two types, asymptomatic uterine fibroids and symptomatic fibroids. Asymptomatic fibroids means there is no symptom which uh, uh, patient is feeling. Uh, when they come for any other problem, like maybe during pelvic examination or ultrasonography, due to another reason, 
and they diagnosed, uh, uh, you know, accidentally. That is asymptomatic uterine fibroid. Symptomatic uterine fibroid where patient has symptom. It can be pain, lower back pain, uh, lower abdominal pain, heavy bleeding, dysmenorrhea, uh, maybe uh, other uh, pressure symptoms also there. So then we call it symptomatic uterine fibroid. So in this study, in every case, patient have some kind of symptoms. So I believe this we can categorize as symptomatic uterine fibroid. So then patients went clinical examination and then this, these all cases confirmed by USG. And the fibroid size, which are the inclusion criteria, is smaller than 14 to 14 to 40 millimeter. Demographic details, gynecological symptoms, and relevant laboratory findings were recorded. In this laboratory finding, blood uh, examinations and urine test also there. Uh, it's just written, but there is no recorded any gynecological symptom or the other findings. Only it said we reported those. Patients willing to undergo medication were provided with detailed explanation of the purpose and effects. As I told you, some uh, patients were advised to go for hysterectomy, but that's why they need to make them understand uh, you are willing to try this treatment. Treatment was prescribed accordingly and patient outcome were analyzed. Then another thing, as I said, uterine fibroid as such in Ayurveda not described in our Granthas, but Granthi Rog, uh, we take it as a, uh, like in uterus if there is encapsulated growth, Garbhashyagat Granthi Rog. And this Granthi involve Vat and Kapha dominance, demanding Vat Kapha medication. Then Dusha, we talk about Rakt, Mans and Medha, and they require Rakt Shodhak, Lekhan properties. Then Shrotu Dushti, it can be Sang here, it can be Ati Pravarti, Vimargaman, even in some cases Shira Granthi uh, are there. So these are managed through Ampachan, Vatanuloman drugs to combat Agni Mandhya, Deepan, Pachan properties are essential. Ayurvedic medicines, which are like widely available, Shigru Gugulu, Kachinar Gugulu, and Haritra Khand were chosen by taking all these. Uh, uh, pathophysiological goals in mind. Then for study design, Shigru Gugulu, each of 250 milligram, two tablet per day. In Shigru Gugulu, the ingredient are Shigru, Pilu, Rasa Sindur and Gugulu. Then Kachinar Gugulu, each of 250 milligram, two tablets. In Kachinar Gugulu, ingredients Manly, Gugulu, Kachnar, Trifla, Trikatu, Varun, Ela, Tavak, etc. In Haridra Khand, it is, uh, the ingredients are Haridra, Trifla, Trikatu, Nishot, Kutaki, Nagarmotha, Chitrak, uh, Jira, Dhaniya, Low Bhasma and Abrak Bhasma. And 3 gram were prescribed to take orally after uh, meal at the interval of 12 hours with the Anupan uh, of milk. Duration of this study was seven weeks and total seven patients were taken. So now case one. It is a 20-year-old unmarried woman with intense abdominal and back pain before and during periods, short treatment. So here the symptom of uh, uterine fibroid, which is she's showing that is dysmenorrhea and it was severe. Previous modern medical intervention, she has taken some uh, medication but it was proved unsuccessful. And in USG, there is a, a uterine fibroid, which is intramural type in the posterior wall of the uterus. Size is 35 into 13 millimeter. So before we go further, let me tell you the uterine fibroid. When we talk about, I said size and uh, uh, location. So uterine fibroid size can be um, from one millimeter to 20 centimeter and more than that. In more simple language, if I say um, the uterine fibroid size as small as a seed and it can be as big as a watermelon. So size differ. Then the location. So it can be in the posterior wall, it can be in anterior wall, it can be outside, inside the cavity. That's like. 
Then when we talk about the types, so there are mainly four types of uterine fibroid. The most common is intramural. So intramural uterine fibroids, these growths are embedded into the uh, middle layer or muscular layer of the uterus or muscular wall of the uterus. Then second type is submucosal uterine fibroids. These kind of fibroids embedded into the mucosal layer or inner lining of the uterus. Then subserous uterine fibroids, which are embedded or growth happen outside or outer layer of the uterus, which is serosal layer of the uterus. And because they are outside of the uterus, they can increase in size and go in the pelvic cavity. And in these kind of uterine fibroid, mainly patient feel pelvic pressure because of the this uh, uterine fibroid size give pressure adjacent organs. Then fourth one is pedunculated uterine fibroid. So pedunculated means uh, these kind of fibroids, they have a stalk or a stem. Uh, we can compare with them as a uh, mushroom. So they have a stalk and then the top of it, they have the growth. So uh, with this, and uh, the prospective combination of, uh, again, the Lakhan, Kafahara medicine, all these, the three uh, uh, formulations we chose with keep in mind that Granthi villain hypothesis, they resulted in decreased pain during the subsequent menstrual cycle. A follow-up ultrasound after seven weeks confirmed a normal study showcasing positive outcomes from the traditional medicine approach. Then case two, a 42-year-old married woman with irregular and excessive periods, lower abdominal and back pain, underwent a pelvic ultrasound revealing uterine fibroid. So 28 into 18 millimeter, it was in the posterior wall and uh, another one is 20 millimeter, 24 into 14 millimeter in the anterior wall. One more, one more thing to add here that uterine fibroid can be single, they can be in cluster, so here, as we see in this case, there are two uterine fibroid and different wall. So prescribe the same combination as the previous case. Her menstrual cycle extended to 28 days. So it's not clear in this that excessive period or irregular. So if they said uh, her menstrual cycle extended to 28 days, so I understood that it was really short cycle metrorrhagia. After the medication, it extends up to 28 days, but still there was increased bleeding. After three weeks without a period, a follow-up ultrasound showed a normal study. The treatment demonstrated positive effects on menstrual regularity and resolved the abnormal bleeding. Then case three, a 47-year-old woman with excessive and irregular periods, abdominal heaviness, weakness, and giddiness was diagnosed with adenomyosis. So as I told you, adenomyosis has similar symptoms, but again, it is not a uterine fibroid. Little bit different, the growth of endometriosis or inner lining of the uterus into the muscular wall of the uterus. And due to this, there is enlarged uterus, size is 84 into 62 into 52 millimeter. Normal size of uterus is the 18 to 50 into 40 millimeter. And this uh, patient was advised hysterectomy by um, gynecologist, but due to some financial constraints, she sought Ayurvedic management before considering the uh, advised hysterectomy. Again, the same combination given to her. Um, targeting uterine growth disorder and it's also led to a significant reduction in uterine size 71 into 57 into 44 millimeter within seven weeks as confirmed by a sonologist and crazed by the positive outcome the patient was recommended to continue the ayurvedic treatment for an extended duration avoiding immediate surgical intervention as a study period was seven weeks but she was uh, advised to continue for extended period of time. Then case four, 26 year old married woman experienced irregular and painful periods along with abdominal and back pain was diagnosed with a 21 into 11 millimeter intramural fibroid in the posterior uterus wall and uh, preferring medical management to preserve reproductive integrity as she just is 26 year old. 
So she received the prescribed combination. So sometime, you know, when um, we talk about the age factor in uterine fibroid, normally I think gynecologists keep in mind, but I, I feel even though you don't need to, uh, you know, family planning is still to keep the integrity of the reproductive system, uh, we should give the option to patient to try alternative treatment. After seven weeks, the fibroid size reduced, providing partial symptomatic relief. Although the ultrasound did not initially report normalcy, she continued the treatment. But after 12 weeks, her menstrual pattern normalized, pain significantly reduced, and a follow-up ultrasound confirmed a normal study. The patient achieved relief without compromising reproductive organs, highlighting the effectiveness of the prescribed approach. So means she also get extended treatment. Then case five, a 35 year old woman with irregular and excessive periods, abdominal and back pain had a submucosal uterine fibroid, 24 into 12 millimeter. And with the uterine fibroid, she has bilateral ovarian cyst, 47 into 32 and 29 into 20, 20 millimeter on ultrasound. And uh, undergoing the prescribed treatment after seven weeks, a follow-up ultrasound revealed a normal study with a uterus of normal size and no ovarian cyst. So ovarian cyst, again, according to the Ayurveda principle, we took it as a uh, under Granthi and Granthi Villian medicines were there. So it is also corrected. The treatment effectively addressed the uterine fibroid and ovarian cyst, leading to a positive outcome reflected in the normalized ultrasound findings. Case 6, a 46-year-old woman with complaints of excessive and irregular periods was diagnosed with a fibroid uterus and bilateral cystic ovaries on ultrasound. In this case, there is uh, no description of the size of the uterus, the location of the uterus, even uh, no size of bilateral cystic ovaries. Sometime I think uh, the patient from where she gone through the USG, sometimes they don't uh, write down the size, but I believe because the inclusion criteria is lower than uh, or smaller than 14 to 14 to 40 millimeter, so size should be smaller than that. Following the prescribed treatment, a subsequent ultrasound after seven weeks revealed a normal uterus and a simple cyst in the left ovary. So here everything is corrected, but there is still a small cyst in the left ovary. The patient also experienced relief from menstrual problem. The treatment not only normalized the ultrasound finding, but also alleviated the symptoms associated with her menstrual issues. Then case seven. A 36-year-old woman presenting with irregular menstrual cycles and abdominal uh, and back pain during and before periods was found to have a uterine fibroid, size 25-25 into 26 millimeter on ultrasound. She was also given the same treatment, a follow-up ultrasound after seven weeks revealed a normal study. The patient experience improved in her menstrual issues showcasing the effectiveness of the treatment protocol in addressing both the uterine fibroid and associated symptom. Then we come to the results. Ultrasonography served as the primary diagnostic tool for confirming uterine fibroid and assessing management outcomes in the case series. With all patients except two showing a normal study on ultrasound after seven weeks, as we saw uh, for two patients, we give them extended uh, uh, treatment. The largest fibro treated was the 35 into 30, 13 millimeter. Increasingly, even cases of adenomyosis, even though it's not exactly uterine fibro, but positive results were reported and size of the enlarged uterus was decreased. Clinically, patients experienced improvement in gynecological complaints. No recurrence was observed clinically or on ultrasound during the six-week follow-up, indicating successful and sustained management outcomes. Then we come to the discussion. So discussion mainly how we choose the Ayurvedic formulation so to treat the uterine fibroid. So uh, we discussed the pathogenesis of Granthi involved vitiation of mansa, which is muscle fiber or flesh, rakta, which is blood, and medodhatu, which is adipose or fat tissue. And then dosha is here, uh, vata and kapha. 
So here, there are many studies we can see they have link between obesity and heightened occurrence of uterine leomyomas or uterine fibroid. There are other studies also available where increased BMI also have the same occurrence with the uterine leomyomas. And when we see the obesity, uh, the dusha and the dosha, they are also same as we see them in Granthi. When uh, we treat thyroid or, um, you know, uh, cervical lymphadenopathy, we take it as also Granthi in Ayurveda, Ayurveda principle. Uh, we keep uh, uh, them as a Granthi villain or the breaking the pathogenesis. So all these things keep in mind, they uh, chose these formulations. So here, first we'll talk about Gugulu. It has analgesic and anti-inflammatory properties characterized by its lagu, which is light, ruksha, which is dry, tikshna, sharp, vishad, clear, sar, mobile, deepen, stomachic and kindling, digestive fire, anuloman, which is removing dosha downward, lekhan, scrapping, medohar, kaf, dorgandehar, which is correcting uh, kapha. Ridhya, cardioprotective, rakta prasadan, blood purifying attributes. All these uh, um, uh, attributes, they beneficial in conditions like obesity, which has a direct connection with the occurrence of the uterine leomyomas, diabetes and associated diseases. Additionally, Google's reported mode of action includes modifying thyroid gland functions as evidence in a study. So when we talk about the risk factor of uterine fibroid, so First comes the age, then obesity or increased BMI, if they have thyroid issues, uh, if they never get conceived, if they have family history, all these things. So these formulations work on those as well. Kajnar Guglu is a classical Ayurvedic formulation and it's used for kapha accumulations in the tissues. Kapha, when deep-seated, may lead to manifestation like swollen lymph nodes or growths. We call them arbud because it's benign, it's not uh, uh, cancerous. Kachnar, Trifla and Trikutu combined with Guglu act as potent decongestants, breaking down and eliminating hardened kapha. This detoxifying blend supports lymphatic and digestive system function, preventing further kapha accumulation. Main ingredients including Kachnar, Varun, Trifla, Trikutu and Trijatak may be beneficial in hypothyroidism. Kajnar Guglu's properties include supporting lymphatic function, balancing kaf dosha, eliminating inflammatory toxins and addressing conditions like cysts, ulcers and tumors. Then Shigru Guglu, it is a patented uh, medicine featuring Shigru, which is rich in thyroid hormone essential iodine. With stomachic properties, it addresses conditions like galgand, which is, uh, I, according to us, hypothyroidism or uh, thyroid gland conditions and joint pain. Pilu, which is Salvadora persica, it complements with analgesic and anti-inflammatory attributes. Ras Sindur here work as a yoga vahi and it increases or enhances the efficacy of the whole formulation. Haridrakhan, an Ayurvedic formulation, is recommended for inflammatory disorders, possessing Vata Kapha Shamak and Trido Shamak properties to balance dosha. Its main ingredient, turmeric, act as a blood purifier, addressing conditions arising from blood vitiation. Haridra exhibits anti-inflammatory, anti-allergic and lekhan scrapping properties, adding in fat metabolism. Trifla, Trikhatu and other ingredients contribute to detoxification, anti-cancer effects, digestive fire improvement and anti-inflammatory action. Even in Haridra Khand, there is low bhasma and abrak bhasma also. So they are supposed to work on the ras and rakta dhatu. When ras and rakta dhatu are corrected, they uh, help to uh, correct the subsequent dhatu. Mans made asthi majja shukra. Ancient Ayurvedic principles. On localized swellings were clinically validated in this case series, emphasizing the efficacy of traditional formulation in this case series. Then we come to the conclusion, Ayurvedic principles guide medical management. I would say conservative medical management for uterine fibroid by utilizing Vataka Fashamak, Rakta Shodhak, Lekhan, Shodhagna, Kledhagna medicine like Kanchanar Gugulu, Shigru Gugulu and Haridrakhan.
their combination. These proved effective in symptoms relieving and complete shrinkage of uterine fibroids, suggesting potential alternatives to surgery in early stages and uh, pending further large scale clinical studies to establish this hypothesis. So I, I, I didn't include any limitations of the study in written, but some points I think we can discuss. So first thing which comes in my mind is that we didn't uh, record any symptoms and we keep saying the gynecological symptoms were improved. And I, I, I feel like uh, to record the gynecological symptoms is important because sometime if we are taking this formulation, maybe uterine fibroid does not shrunk and it's okay because if we get the symptom relief, it is fine for the patient because it's a benign tumor. It doesn't harm further and less than 0.1% of all uterine fibroids turn in cancerous growth. So it's a very, very less number. So one thing and uh, there are many studies available where we can say CAM complementary or alternative medicines were used by women by themselves to treat the symptoms of uterine fibroid because surgery is something hysterectomy. Nobody wants to go for that. So they take by themselves and that's why they are not, uh, uh, the, the data uh, collect those is not easy. So again, uh, females using them, they are eager to, adopt these alternative and complementary therapies, one thing. Uh, then another thing, the studies was seven week. Um, so I feel at least three months, or if we can go uh, some for more months, uh, it would be great. So we can see uh, with the symptom relief and uh, um, you know, the uterine, um, how long it take to shrink because uh, it is hard to say in two months because sometimes uh, some female cycle is not every time it's 28 day cycle. Even 35 days, we, we say 21 to 35 days is normal cycle. So I believe at least three uh, menstrual cycles, if we can carry the study, it would be uh, great. So uh, these are some things I, I, I can see uh, can be done. Uh, so uh, I really uh, thankful author of this case series, Dr. Kamini Dhiman, and I also thankful to give me this opportunity to counsel of Ayurveda research. So this is from my side. Any comments, any suggestions, please feel free to ask. And uh, with this note, thank you so much. <clears throat> Ji Didi, should thank I stop so sharing? Yeah, please. Yeah, so we can see okay. each other. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, thank yeah. you, first of all, uh, for presenting at short notice. Yeah, uh, that's that's really incredible. Um, uh, very interesting study. But before I comment, uh, Dr. Mukta, did you want to say anything? Yeah. Hello, Dr. Mukta. Yes. Hello. Thank you for such a nice uh, presentation and uh, this study is also so many case uh, um, cases taken. Very nice. Thank you. And uh, this is the first time I, I was wanting to attend other uh, um, GCAR um, uh, presentations that uh, you people have been um, scheduling. But uh, good that I attended this one now at least. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Some of the previous <laughs> ones so are much. on our YouTube channel. So do okay. Yes, I'll I'll uh, remember that whenever I uh, get time, I'll remember if I have to search. I'm searching something on YouTube. I'll search this first. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and I uh, I had a, a few. Th this was so thought provoking. It it started. Um, my thoughts about what I give on what and uh, I'm comparing this uh, um, um, study medicines used here with what I, I had given and some other uh, medicines that uh, came to my mind. So I, I have uh, a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing is, uh, 
uh, i know um, um, there has to be objective da data for comparison so sonography was used but uh, if we look at the clinical um, examinations there might be patients who don't have um, irregular menstruation just heavy menstrual bleeding like there was one case with the cycle extended only for 28 days but the bleeding part uh, of the cycle was for more days so uh, uterine fibroid may be there or adenomyosis but the cycle is regular with heavy bleeding mm -hmm. and dysmenorrhea so um, should those cases should we think differently about those two cases yeah that's I why know, i that, that okay. someone but someone else but still um, i wanted uh, uh, to discuss this point the um, cycle being irregular and cycle being regular with uh, such like uh, clinical presentations and mm -hmm. second question was that um, vata kapha ja when we say so mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, in our granthas it is given um, dushti of vat and dushti of kapha um, rakta ja um, sorry vata ja dushti of rakta and kapha ja dushti of rakta will be different so can we although granthi has uh, is tridoshatmak like shot little uh, tridoshatmak but more of vata kapha and shot is more uh, tridoshic but uh, adenomyosis uh, um, um, can be only shot and um, um, uterine fibroids uh, not just adenomyosis but uterine uh, fibroids showing in sonography that uh, might be more vata kapha instead of uh, um, tridoshic uh, and third question was that if i, I mean for what treatment uh, difference can we make with uh, uterine fibroids and no uterine fibroids but adenomyosis another third question was that if there is um, if there is vataja dushti more then uh, should we think um, of more vataja dushti than kafaja then should we uh, and the patient is not obese the patient is thin. So then should we go for Kanchanar Gugul, maybe Shigru Gugul and uh, the contents are different, but Kanchanar specifically, which does bhedan of um, um, uh, kapha, not, not only kapha, but um, uh, what should I say? Stable, uh, stable hard kapha. It does mm -hmm. bhedan of that. So should we use Kanchanar Gugul? Will it give... Um, side effects in more of vataja patient with vataja dushti of rakta these are the th okay. three questions okay dr mukta I take a breath so first question was you asked cycle is irregular or regular but in both cases heavy bleeding right and that's why uh, before i say something i mentioned that that's why i didn't put the limitations of this case series because what i think is that Again, as you said, in uterine fibroid, I believe they took the symptomatic uterine fibroid only. They have some symptoms, one thing. Then mm -hmm. again, they said because of this uh, combination of the formulations, they get relief in clinical uh, symptoms. But maybe that is not their objective, first thing. So that's why they didn't put too much attention if they have irregular, regular, what symptoms they have, they just mentioned. And if mm -hmm. they get relief, they didn't record anything in the study then your second question is i think you asked uh it's what kaf dushti when it's uh not every time it's what kaf dushti it can be raktas dushti more short i completely uh, I mean, agree. adenomyosis and uterine fibroid that uh, differentiation so, yeah so i completely agree but how they took it that uterine fibroid they take as a just simple entity and then they go in the Ayurveda and they think, okay, can we correlate it with Granthi? They work on the Granthi pathogenesis or some prati, how it happens. So in mm -hmm. first, you know, because it's the uterus or, uh, you know, the lower part where Vata Dosha is, uh, you know, predominant. So first Vata Dosha Dushti is there. Definitely any kind of gynecological disorder, we know Vata mm -hmm. Dushti is there. Then when you try to get like something happen in the pathogenesis or, you know, swelling or any kind of hardened tissue, kapha is there. So kapha vikriti. If we don't treat that, you can see if there is high, uh, heavy bleeding, definitely pitta uh, uh, involvement is there. But not every patient with uterine fibroid has heavy bleeding, right? They have uh, pelvic pressure symptoms. So maybe their vata dushti is there. 
uh, more than than other doshas. So maybe this how they take a general consideration. They don't go because they didn't take any Ayurvedic assessment tool used in this case series. Hmm. That's I can only say. Then hmm. I think next question uh, you ask. Um, what what, what? Uh, differentiation of the treatment between uterine fibroid and adenomyosis, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if we go, what, what I think, again, I'm not the author of the case series, but what I think uterine fibroid they take is a granthi. But again, when we think about adenomyosis, it's again the enlargement of the uterus. Same vata dushti, same kapha dushti there. And I think dushya is also same. So they try to give the same treatment and they get the result. That's what I can say. And uh, another thing you ask if uh, some patient, what this dushti is there or they are not obese, they don't have. As I said, like thyroid also, they can be, they should notice if patient has hypothyroidism. What is their weight? They can help. But what I believe their goal is to make a set of formulation which can use any kind of uterine fibroid. Then, according to you, you can personalize the treatment. That's what I understood. Because mm. if we give the individualized treatment in a case series, then it will be too much hard for them to, you know, give. So I think they take your time. Inclusion as... criteria. Um, yeah. The inclusion criteria of patient was set, and then uh, so. Yeah. Uh, those only were... criteria they took the uterine fibroid size is less than 14 to 14 to 40 millimeter that's it the other criteria they didn't took so i believe they just want to set a ayurvedic formulation intervention any kind of uterine fibroid you can shrink the size or maybe you can get the relief in symptom so mm. that's from my side i can say mm. thank yeah. you Thank you, Dr. Mukta, for joining and for asking some really good questions. And thank you, Dr. Rajesh, for answering very nicely in detail. Yeah, I try. So I also have some questions or comments. Okay. Um, I think overall, it is a good effort to present uh, a series of cases. However, again, the purpose of Journal Club is not to just discuss research, but to discuss critically. Mm -hmm. And critical discussion means that you're paying attention to so many points that are uh, pertaining to the uh, publication. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I think uh, they have not defined very clearly their objectives and their inclusion criteria is very limited Number one, like uterine fibroids. However, case number three is not a uterine fibroid. And why was mm -hmm. it included? You know? Yeah. And there, the size of the, uh, you know, uterus is mentioned. There is no size of the fibroids because there's no diagnosis there. Mm -hmm. So then they should have not included. So this is kind of a little um, gap in their own case where they are saying we are including cases of uterine fibroids. However, case number three very clearly does not have a diagnosis of fibroids. Then I wish they could have done a little better job of defining the age uh, as a criteria for inclusion because two of the cases are perimenopausal. Yes, absolutely. You know, 46 this, and 47. Yeah. So that is another thing. Then I just want to uh, complete two, two more comments that um, the formulations that they have chosen. Um, first of all, I was not very impressed by how they shared, uh, how the author shared the list of ingredients. It's just a screenshot and it does not clearly distinguish the three products. One, it does not uh, name the company. Mm -hmm. It does not name from which text? Is it from Sharangdhar Samhita or some other text? Number four, to the best of my knowledge, Shigru Guglu is a Kashta Aushadi. It's not a Ras Aushadi. There is, I have no idea which Shigru Guglu has Ras Sindurin. Mm -hmm. So that, I am I'm a really, uh, I was taken aback when I read that. Yeah. And even Haridra Khan, uh, it is mentioning Aprakpasma, 
to the best of my knowledge, and I check a little bit, I don't see a person anywhere. So there is this problem of um, lack of clear references. Uh, and if you're listing some ingredients that maybe some company is using, the company name would have been helpful. Uh, also, I would have liked to see an appendix attachment with the actual ultrasound before and after. Yes. Because that is what brings credibility to the publication. So they were, I feel, loopholes. Yeah. And um, I do want to pick up what Dr. Mukta was also mentioning that, um, you know, if it is a Bata Prakruti person, um, then probably we need to use some Grita pre preparations. You know, we cannot be giving four Gugulu doses a day for seven weeks. And again, that duration is also short. So if you, this is what the purpose of the journal club meeting is, not to just read research papers and yeah. feel glorious about it, but actually why these kind of cases will get rejected mm -hmm. on a, on an international platform, yeah, because okay. they will go through all this that, you know, you're all over the place, mm -hmm. you know, because you're in the beginning, you're not defining your criteria properly and then um, you are going out of whatever little you have mentioned in case number three. And lastly, I mean, there are many things I can continue to comment. But lastly, also, uh, details would have been helpful. Uh, were they on birth control pills? Did they have any, any IUDs? Um, things like that, you know, married, unmarried, some kind of tabulation of mm -hmm. intake, you know. What were the things in the intake? So, yeah, many things same comes in my mind. Shigru, Yara, Sindur, I also never heard. But in Haridra Khand, uh, in uh, Rajasthan, I think Ajmer, Kaleda, in the formulation, they have Loha Bhasma. But in their book, they say sometime if you feel, but again, as you said, they need to uh, say the company name. Yes. So it will be easy to understand. And then Vata thing, if we, we they, you notice the with Haridra Khand, they give Anupan. With another thing, they didn't say any Anupan. So maybe again, you said, maybe they think, again, we are guessing, right? So Haridra Khand with Anupan, with uh, milk as a Anupan, I think they want to do the things. They are doing a Google, they are too dry for the Vatik person. So maybe somehow they make the formulation thing, but no detailing what they are so... Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So there is a lot so, of room for a proper, like, objective and yeah. clear, uh, clear, defined study. Yeah. You know, you cannot have some criteria, then you're yeah. going out of it, and then you're excluding details. Like, one yes. case did not have any details. Yes, it. yes. And mm -hmm. yeah, if it's, uh, yeah, so these kind of study, if we present with the really good details, they, they can really help many women. I they believe. can help. So it yeah. is a good kind of, a, a, you know, a example good. study, you can yeah. say, just yeah. as an example. Okay, there is there are some good things you can pick up. But again, designing of, you know, whatever, even if you're reporting cases, how to report them. These are, this is the purpose of the journal club that, you know, yeah. uh, the author uh, could have, again, we are not here to criticize anybody yeah. or any publication but because this is in the interest of research literacy um, these are some of the points that I think are highlighted through the study mm -hmm. that we can do things a little better yeah. in terms of sharing uh, the logic uh, the details of your intervention products you know which company what reference um, having a uh, an appendix with all the reports uh, that is helpful, really, to to actually see. I mean, you can cross out the names and, you know, there are ways yeah. to share without um, mm -hmm. breaching the privacy. Thank you. Yeah. This is <laughs> a very good discussion. And thank you, yeah. everyone, for participating. And I'll over yeah. to Dr. Ritika. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rajesh. I do agree that they could have shared some details about the case, which could have helped when they're saying that they did get symptomatic relief. They could have shared more details about the case and symptoms. 
uh also i did uh, i had one question why did they mention shigru gokul as patent medicine that was uh, yeah kind so of weird. that's that's Classic. why i think uh, what prativadi is saying maybe they used a uh, specific company shigru gokul that's why they yeah. patented maybe then maybe they cannot because... call it shigru gokul they have to name it something else because when it is shigru <laughs> gokul it's classical yeah. it's not patent yeah so, so yeah. how can they patent it or it they i'm sure they must be calling it something else if they have added just a symbol to it yeah then. these are all the questions um if i mean another follow up of this would be to send some of these questions to the author and see how they respond because that is something that is very common in the scientific world that you can send questions to any author of a published mm-hmm. uh paper and ask them questions so you know that's another possibility <laughs> yeah yes <laughs> uh, all right uh, thank you so much uh, thank you dr pratibha for sharing your insight thank you dr rajesh for the presentation you were really good you were excellent you shared each and every information rightly and also explained uterine fibroids Uh, so well with different types of uterine fibroids and also the formulation thank you dr mukta for participating and sharing your insights um thank you all for attending this journal club meeting um please thank you watch and subscribe yeah okay so thank you for this opportunity successful case presentation gives uh, of other doctors also gives us confidence to treat uh, our own patients absolutely that is the absolutely. goal so stay tuned for the next <laughs> journal club meeting which will okay. be in february every okay. month we have journal club meetings so okay yes yeah thanks a lot so, thank you thank you everyone before we uh, sign out uh, i just want to say please watch and subscribe to our youtube channel Uh, to stay updated with the latest research in Ayurveda, uh, please like, comment, and share. Uh, once again, I would like to invite you to become a member of GCAR to get access to all the resources, and also you can volunteer. Uh, to volunteer, you can email us. Uh, on our web, on our email, uh, our email is Ayurveda Research USA at gmail dot com. uh thank you again hope to see you again uh, next month and i also just want to quickly add membership is so nominal it's just $15 for the whole year for students and i think it's 25 for the whole year for anybody else so it's super nominal okay. it's just okay. a support for us because we have lot of back end expenses like any other non profit so every little drop helps so please sign up as a member yes yes Thank <laughs> you.